And Judy, don't forget to leave. Eh? Bye. Well, there's been a whole lot uh, spoken about going on and uh, what happened in South Africa over the past week. What's bothering me is that many of the people who are making the uh, assumptions and opinions and telling us the rest, telling the rest of us what's going on, are actually sitting behind keyboards far away from the action. Well, that's not the case uh, with James Martin, who is in uh, Peter Maritzburg. He is the head of department for economic development at the Mgunglovo uh, district, which is uh, Mgunglovo, the place of elephants. That's the uh, Sleepy Hollow, Correct. isn't it, James? Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, what is the what is the job that you do uh, within the organisation? Well, thanks very much for having me today. Um, my the position I hold is looking at the economy of the KZN Midlands. Um, and combining it with the way we do our town planning. So it's to stimulate investment, to make sure we retain whatever enterprises we have, and to plan our towns and cities in and around the Midlands in a way that's, that uh, supports investment and economic activity. It seems all theoretical about what happened in the past week. I mean, you're looking to grow and to plan things, and my goodness, it's like a hurricane hit you. It's a bitter pill to swallow. It's it's uh, during those days we woke up thinking, hoping it was a dream, uh, a bad dream, and it wasn't. It was reality. We're busy picking up the pieces now, and uh, I, yes, I, I'd like to say that there's there's a buzz around at the moment. I think people are just edging to get back and to get cracking and get get start earning their salaries and and start trading again. But I spoke with, yeah. with Melanie Vaness, who you obviously know very well from the Maritzburg yeah. Chamber, uh, and she was very shell-shocked in the middle of the, uh, all the chaos. Uh, how much damage was done to the city and, and the surrounding district? Well, I've, we do have the statistics. I don't have them at my fingertips, but I can say that uh, each town except Camperdown in this district was damaged severely. Richmond was almost flattened. Uh, the area to the east of Peter Maritzburg, the smaller towns there, they were almost, uh, the businesses were almost flattened. Um, in Howick, uh, it's a town most people may have heard of. Uh, we're estimating around 40 businesses have been uh, looted, some have been burnt. Uh, Moy River on the on the freeway, obviously, a number of, of, of businesses there have also. So, and then in Peter Maritzburg itself, uh, um, a couple of major shopping centres, especially in the in the in the black townships, uh, they've been destroyed, um, and burnt to the ground. Uh, with I think only four shopping centres still standing, out of I estimate probably double that number. So, the centre of town itself, uh, I went through on the day uh, during the days uh, of the of the this treachery, and um, it it was a it was a war zone. You, your car couldn't drive through the streets because of of the of the rubbish and the the debris on the roads and people were loitering, scavenging through whatever was left. It really was a war zone at the time. I'm happy to say today, driving through it, it's a lot. It's obviously been cleaned up and it's safe and there's police presence. And there is a sense of calm that's returned, but you can't help noticing the the destruction and and the looted. I mean, massive uh, furniture shops that are now just uh, they've been burnt. They there's no other way to describe it. They're black shells of of nothing. So. Yeah, it's hit. I think it's hit hit everybody in the solar plexus, uh, especially from a business point of view. Some of them feel they can bounce back. Some of them feel that it's a bridge too far now to come back. Mm. So some of the businesses that perhaps you were hoping would be expanding in the city and in the district are going to be doing the opposite. Well, yes and no. I think what's happened is is this: the removal of some businesses has created a vacuum for others. I think those who are fast on their feet, those who obviously food is the, is the first point of call. I think those who can move quickly, can supply food to the rural areas where previously there was a shopping center are going to, are going to flourish under the circumstances. It may see a shift in who supplies food uh, to our communities going forward. And my suspicion is it may also be um, a number of foreign nationals because they, they, they're dominating the, that informal food chain right now. Um, 
So, you know, for, for a lot, the insurance companies will have to kick in and, and, and pick up the slack for them. But for the most part, I think there, there's no way around the damage that it has done, no matter what business you've had. It has hit you on the fairly, fairly on the jaw and uh, coming back is going to be a, quite a climb. And like I said, for some businesses, they just can't carry that. James, I'd like to get your take on this because there's a lot of debate going on in the national media at the moment. People we've spoken to, and here I would include uh, Gigi Alcock, who's who's from KZN, from rural KZN, uh, Dr. Suleiman, um, uh, Jason McCormick, whose uh, shopping centre in Edendale was one that was completely destroyed. They are under yeah. no doubt whatsoever that this was treason, that it was uh, instigated. You mentioned earlier treachery, um, so I'd, I'd like you to just expand on that. And now we get the other side of the fence, the defense minister, Mapisa um, Kula, uh, saying that it was just thuggery. Uh, where, you've well plugged in there, uh, clearly. How are you reading what happened? I have to be careful how I answer this. Obviously, I, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of government. I'm not a spokesperson for government. I think I'm, I'm just giving an opinion, which is my personal opinion. I think when when this started uh, and we let what we thought was a puppy dog out of a cage, I don't think we realized it was a kraken. Uh, it, was, it was something that once the floodgates had opened, it was something that would be hard to um, to squash judging by how easily a shop can be looted. And none of us, for most of us, it's something that never occurred to us, but I think it is something that can happen physically really easily. You open the door and you take out what you need to. That's how simple it is. It's easier than shopping if you look at it like that. Um, I, I, I do want to say from, from my vantage point, and we, we headed up, I, I'm the deputy chair of the security forum in the, in the northern part of town. We had over 300 um, civilians of all cultures uh, patrolling 24-7. Uh, some of them armed, some of them weren't, but we had the fires going at night. And um, we were, I, I would say with some confidence, we were part of the team that defended the malls. Um, and uh, scouts would come around into the area looking to see what sort of barricades we had in place. And then they would go back and report to what, whoever they were reporting to. But I think it... I, and again, I, I don't want to say too much uh, out of place, but there were there were in the, there were pockets of gangs who were spearheading this this looting, and I, I, it's hard to say their origin or their mandate if they even had one. Um, but there was a group of of people who would spearhead this. They would open the doors, they would start the fires, and they'd be followed by a mass of of willing and hungry people. So even they, I don't think, realized how how much momentum they would carry behind them once they opened those doors to these shops. Uh, it, you know, you, you can call it uh, political, I'm not, uh, and I'm not saying it is by any means, but it was thuggery. And I think to the average person that you would stop on the street now of Peter Marisburg, they, they would call it treachery to some degree. Of all cultures, um, there is this feeling that we've let ourselves down, that it, it's it's been a poor show, and uh, there's possibly some embarrassment around the degree to which it's, it's taken uh, how we viewed around the world. How have we let ourselves down, though? Surely there's a there's a group of people who have committed some treacherous acts, rather than uh, the public generally. From from my family, who are in the south of Peter Maritzburg, they were like you patrolling. They had the fires. They were they were out all night, um, and also saw the scouts and uh, who, who were looking to perhaps come into their areas. One or two shopping centres are still standing as a result of that action by the community so perhaps on the one hand uh, the broader community might feel quite proud of what they've done i look it's hard for it's hard to speak on their behalf but i think looking back uh, at the time i think people may have been caught up in in the euphoria of this uh, scoring a, a, a 72 inch flat screen is something that a lot of people and for most people that's completely out of reach it's a it's a never in a lifetime occurrence so for them, that may be the case. I mean, you may have seen the videos. I think it was a three-kilometer stretch of, of cars uh, at the one logistics center loading up what they could, and that's the middle class. So um, it's, hard, it's, hard, it's hard to to justify that for people who uh, I believe somewhere are in, in positions in government. I, I'm not, I, can't stand, I can't say that with any surety, but 
one would think that they're from across the middle class employment spectrum and and i think people now that i'm speaking to are are realizing that it's it really was it is something that's hard to justify um not only given the fact that people have lost their jobs for this last week so so that's a quarter of your income gone and if you're a small income earner that's 25 percent of your domestic uh monthly revenue which is significant um but also i think if you look outside of the out of the barrel if you can see outside of the barrel to the rest of the world we've now become a um a place not to invest it's i don't even i don't even know if we're a zero investment i think we're in a negative uh digits around whether or not we're we're a suitable investment destination especially for the for foreign direct investment which is what we're trying to attract and i think i think that's the message that's uh being picked up more and more by local people is to say wow it's not just uh the local spaza shop that we looted actually we've created an image of ourselves which we're going to spend a long time reconstructing uh, the effects of this are, are going to go beyond just the cleanup campaign and the refilling of, of shops that we're busy with now. One of the biggest uh, companies in Peter Maritzburg is Hulerman. Uh They did manage to protect their plant. Uh, again, uh, secondhand, uh, they have mercenaries there looking after, uh, trying to keep the, well, managing to keep the uh, hordes at bay. Were there any other similar stories of of companies that that managed to hoard off or or, or ward mm. off uh, the looters. Well, my I have heard from a reliable source that the Checkers uh, distribution center, the Checkers flew down uh, their own guards from Johannesburg, put them in a helicopter from uh, King Shaka Airport to the rooftop of the distribution center, where they were holding uh, a substantial amount of stock, and I think that's been our saving grace. The other distribution centers weren't so lucky. They they were caught napping, um, but checkers were proactive and they managed to do that. In and around Maritzburg, uh, the Muslim community were quite effective. They own, they have huge interests in this town and they, uh, they've they been very active um, in defending uh, their assets. So, yeah, I would, there are a number of cases on the, on the side of town where there is a lot of Muslim trade, a lot of factories where they have, and in fact, driving through the center of town, during those days, uh, you almost couldn't get through town. The barricades were so intense. Um, again, and, yeah, and uh, I don't want to call them mercenaries, but I don't think they were local uh, Sunday school teachers protecting our streets. <laughs> mm, the Muslim community did uh, did mo did action uh, or get active very quickly from the feedback we've had. Perhaps because they're a close community and other communities as well, which you wouldn't have expected, uh, also stepped up to the plate. Mm. That's true. Um, and, and you know, when we when I first started this, I mean, I feel like this is a family meeting. I feel like I can talk freely. When we first started this, there was some suspicion uh, around why is this, why are these whites being so, so defensive and barricading in a democratic society? But as, as things got more and more intense, we found uh, Zulus joining us, Khaled's, you know, we had the whole spectrum coming on board, realizing that that Kraken, we'd let out the cage. Uh, we didn't know where it would stop. But if I could say there's a there's a there's a consequence to what we're saying that is was unforeseen that is possibly not uh, has a, a negative side to it in the more rural towns, the traders again many of whom are Muslim, together with the commercial farmers have been protecting the towns and in some cases, stopped access into towns and in some cases that's been the saving grace of the commercial activity in that town. Nongoma, for example, I believe is flattened. Um, and that service is probably a 30 kilometer radius, I'm estimating, of half a million people. You know, that really compromises people's ability to access basic foodstuffs in that. I know we'll, we'll, we'll as a species, be able to get, to bounce back. And they, I don't think there will be hunger, as we initially thought. But what's happened is um, the, the whites, the commercial farmers and the Muslim traders have, have barricaded rural towns. And it's been seen something through through racial eyes. So there are some towns in, in the outlying areas where um, damage control is probably the wrong word. But we're having to go in and say, guys, uh, drop the racial card. Um, it, it wasn't whites and, and coloreds and, and Indians uh, stopping you walking through a democratic street. Um, it was saving your business. And can we please try and not play the race card? So there, there were a couple of municipalities where um, these echoes have been sounding. 
but I think uh, government is doing whatever they can to try and just to nullify those those voices because they, they it, it is of some concern. James, when I spoke with Melanie Vanessa again to bring her back into the conversation, mm. she said she was calling for a state of emergency. She said that many of the businesses in Peter Maritzburg had been flattened, and that in the absence of having the army uh, in in situ, uh, the rest of them were going to go as well. Uh, I suppose the big question is the the absence of the security forces for such a long time in in such a uh, a heavily attacked area um it's hard to read it's hard to read what's on the street my 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 sense being on the ground is inclining towards a, sta a stable uh, future certainly for the short to medium term i'd like to say that the taxi industry have played a huge role in bringing calm to our waters um and will continue to do so i think without their assurance uh, in bringing the stability at a provincial level, uh, I wouldn't be speaking as confidently as I am. Also, I think that people have realized how this has damaged uh, people's livelihoods going forward. I think that there's a sense of calm that has returned. Like I said in the beginning, it, looting a shop, I, we've all realized how easy it is. We all thought it was, a, it was something that could never be done, but just looking at how easy it was to walk in and carry out a big screen and load it up into your Mercedes, it, it, it's almost it's it's almost miraculous that you can you can shop so easily unfortunately but I, I i i'm not sure when you spoke to melanie and certainly if you had spoken to us a week ago i in fact had suggested that my family leaves town because we couldn't the crystal ball had clogged up we couldn't see into the crystal ball we really thought that there was going to be food shortages in fact the first time i went into a shop i bought milli meal and rice um, because I thought we were in for a long haul of, uh, of limited resources, but that, obviously that wasn't to be. So a week ago, I would have shared Melanie's sentiments. Driving through town this morning, I went into the office. People are trading. People are walking on the streets. Um, I didn't see a police person. I didn't see an SANDF person. People were going about their business. And uh, I can say... I have permission to say on behalf of the taxi industry, although I'm not their spokesperson, that uh, they are manning the situation very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. And they have shown s real solidarity towards stabilizing. Um, they've had they've had meetings in the ta outlying towns. They've been giving businesses assurance in and around this city to the outlying towns, through the associations, through the, the structures, to say that that's, this, this will not happen again under their watch. Uh, and they are a force to be reckoned with. I mean, they, they, they are a very, very powerful and very structured army of highly intelligent and decent guys who have taken the law, not the law into their hands, but they have put a firm grip on people's movements and, and, and what's happening, especially in the townships from where a lot of these people have been coming. I did speak to Melanie right in the middle of all the chaos, so uh, no doubt she yeah. she would uh, share your sentiments now. But getting back to the taxi association again, uh, when Jason McCormick was telling us there was a two-hour firefight between uh, that advanced guard and uh, and his security guards, his guys were only allowed to shoot a birdshot and and rubber bullets, law-abiding. Uh, those who were attacking them were with R1s and R4s. And he said that was turned around by the taxi association arriving there and just firing back with live ammunition. So these guys are all <laughs> clearly well armed and don't and have their own the their own approach to these things. But why would the taxi association have gotten involved in in the first place in restoring calm? Well, first of all, the taxi industry is in an interesting place in its own trajectory. It's wanting to take center stage in the uh, in the commercial first first world platform. They do ninety odd billion a year turnover. They, people say they don't pay taxes, but if you look at the the tax they pay on on forty billion rands worth of fuel, the tax they pay in VAT on uh, on the whatever fifteen billion they spend on tires, they're a massive contributor not only uh, in the taxes and the revenues that they pay, but in terms of getting us us all, all our staff and everybody to work. So they are they are underway uh, through Santaco, the National Association, and Taxi Choice, the commercial arm, to become a major force. They've acquired shares in uh, various financial institutions. They've acquired shares in Toyota dealerships. So they are wanting to be seen as a a central force in the economy. 
Um, if you'd spoken to the taxi industry 10 years ago, a lot of them were the older guys who started out with Valiance. They didn't have education. The taxis, that those Valiants that they started out with paid for education. The kids coming through now uh, in their 30s and 40s have been to varsity. They've got degrees. They're now running dad's taxis. Uh, there's a new layer of uh, of skills coming through uh, across the South African taxi landscape. So th I think the, the level of um, business acumen um, is rising. And with it comes that level of, I suppose, uh, responsibility in in this in this commercial environment so i think that's the first point is that they've realized that they th that this image of of uh, a thug taxi violence um doesn't suit them it doesn't suit it doesn't encourage passengers uh and it doesn't endear them on the roads so they, there's that that ongoing drive and i was with taxi choice on their national executive five years ago we sort of started that back then and 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 it's an ongoing process um, so that's the first thing is they want to be seen as integral to our economy uh, as a force to be reckoned with. But also, of course, uh, most of their vehicles are, are bonded, uh, are, are funded through banks. Um, and for every day that a taxi is not on the road, he's got to he's got to make that day back to pay his uh, his bond, his his vehicle finance. So it was imperative for them and their survival. You know, COVID took their guts out. Uh, they're busy recovering from that, although the banks were quite kind and charging interest and reduced rates and not repossessing when they may have done so. So there's been a lot of um, support from the commercial side in supporting the taxi industry. But I think a knock like this in the province would would have would have shown their underbellies. They'd be lying on their backs now if if it had gone on for much longer. So I think for them it was a um, a survival kick in as well to make sure that the wheels keep turning and that the customers are still um, you know paying for their taxi fare coming into town paying the driver so i suppose it's two pronged they want the economy they want to be part of the economy but they also need to keep their fleet moving what about that so. dynamic between the owners of the taxis and those who drive them because quite often they they are in different uh, live in different parts of town, as it were, with the owners being relatively well off. And now you're saying second generation business people, whereas the drivers, many rural Zulus who might be, uh, might have had more affection with the, uh, with those who were creating the looting than with their bosses. <laughs> it's an interesting dynamic. It is an interesting one. You raise a good point uh, because the taxi industry for drivers, many for many of the drivers, you're correct. It's it's a it's a place you can go to with almost no education, and you can work and you can earn an honest living. So um, very often your your driver skill sets are limited. Some some are driver owners, but very few. But I think uh, worth noting is that the average uh, the last research we did the average number of taxis owned by an owner is 1.3 taxis uh, per operator. If he's making nine between nine and fifteen grand a month per taxi, you know the, the, this perception that they're all swimming in cash um, isn't true. And then the older vehicles, if you lose a gearbox, it's out of it's out of commission for two weeks. You're spending twenty five grand on a new gearbox. So as the new quantums are coming through, and it's mostly quantums, and with the with the motor plans, etc., uh, their businesses are stabilizing. Um, but yes, uh, I think the, the smarter guys are, div are divesting, buying in, buying other businesses, uh, and and that's always been the name of the industry is not to rely solely on your commuter base for your for your revenue. So a lot of them have divested; they've got interests elsewhere in other commercial enterprises. So yeah, but having said that, um, and 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 although I've been singing their praises as as a group of of gentlemen, there is that side to them which um, you don't want to get on the wrong mm. side of. And it has to be like that. Uh, you, it's it's two hundred thousand vehicles. Um, the routes are regimented. You you can't stray from a particular route. It has to have that level of of military kind of discipline. And um, sometimes it takes it takes on a, a shape and a and a form that we may not, that may not be palatable palatable to us. But it does unfortunately hold hold the the it holds that network together. So if you had one or two um, rogue drivers trying to go and be part of the looting uh, going forward. I, they, uh, I'm not saying they won't survive. Um, they probably won't keep their job. Is probably the best thing that would happen to them. But uh, mm -hmm. going forward, I think the instructions from the top are very are very clear. No, no more of this. You get back and you drive like you've always been doing, it, which is encouraging. An, yeah, indeed. Another interesting mm -hmm. dynamic is that the Taxi Association has taken on government. 
And we've seen this as members of the public during COVID, uh, where a certain percentage was allowed in a taxi and the windows were supposed to be open and that was just ignored. So it's, it's almost like there is this force, which some would have interpreted as a force for, uh, for bad or an evil force in that context, depending on what side of the COVID fence you stay. Whereas mm. in this context, suddenly uh, there would be lots mm. of people ordinary people, ordinary folk who saying, well, thank heavens they guys were around because what might have happened otherwise? Could you, could you, could you speculate on that? If the taxi guys had not been involved, uh, what yeah. might have happened to Peter Maritzburg? No, you are 100% right. And, you know, I, I, I've been around a while and I have to say that the taxi industry is an industry that I, I, I really respect and, and, and admire uh, because of the power that it wields. And, I think as South Africans, we can be grateful that it hasn't abused that power. Under COVID, there were one or two instances where um, you could get in an airplane, you could sit next to someone for five hours to to wherever, ever fly to, wherever, but you couldn't get into a taxi. And there was all sorts of stories about the air being compressed, et cetera, et cetera. And the taxi industry took, I think, was a pretty brave decision uh, in protecting their numbers. And they had their reasons. I was part of those discussions with them while they, while they were planning that. It does show the strength that they hold. And for the most part, um, and I can say this with some confidence, they're not they're not they're not going to take decisions against the grain of what's best for South Africa. So if they're feeling like they're being prejudiced in any way, as any industry would strike, they may strike back because they're feeling like they're being prejudiced in one way or another as an industry. But I would like South Africans to have comfort in the fact that the taxi industry's decision making is based on a better South Africa for all. And for me, that's very encouraging. And I think we've seen it. what's happened in Peter Maritzburg over the last couple of days is where they did take that decision at a provincial level. And basically overnight, they calmed the waters down. And I think, like I said, as South Africans, I know when you're in traffic and it's the end of a long day and a taxi overtakes you on the, on the pavement, the temptation is to let your blood boil, but but that taxi is saving 15 other cars from parking in front of you. There's 15 people in that car. And if you think about it, we don't have the road infrastructure for those taxis. They've got to fit between the cracks. Um, and in many cases, it's the commuters who are forcing them to drive fast because the commuters are late for work. So very often, um, you know, it's, it's easy to, to we, we, we point fingers at the industry as such, uh, but very often, um, I would like to stand stand to their defense to say that they have the best interests of South Africa at heart. Okay, there's some scallywags out there as in any industry uh, and people jump into sections and that which is hard to forgive. But they also have deadlines. They have passengers who are late for work that are forcing them, that are, are shouting at them because if that driver doesn't jump the robot, if he doesn't do that, they're going to go with the next driver tomorrow and that driver is not going to have any passengers. So... You know, it's tough out there. It's a balancing act for them all the time. And like I said, they have to they have to travel between the cracks because in most cases, the infrastructure for public transport is not there. But a huge shout out to them for the calm that they brought, not only to Peter Marisburg, but to the province. And I think going forward, it, it, and I think I'm hoping that people understand the role that they do play in our society. And I sit with the decision makers of the industry um, and, and I have huge confidence in the, in their integrity. And in their decision-making powers, they are they are gentlemen. They are solid. The guys I deal with have no bodyguards because they don't they don't need them because they 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 shoot they don't shoot clean. They 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 talk clean. They don't look behind their back because in the in the taxi industry, if I say to you, I'll be here at two o'clock next Wednesday, I will be there at two o'clock next Wednesday. That's how they live. It's a no nonsense, no frills industry, and and I think uh, all respect to them for the way that they've held together this province if they hadn't let's just say they like the uh, security mm. forces had gone a war yeah what would have happened yo i i i think i think we'd still be doing our night patrols i think we'd still you know i i picked up the phone the first first call i made was to the leadership to say guys you need to sort out the freeway we need the n3 opened within half an hour we were on the phone to sandrail uh, and the taxi guy said, that's fine. From now on, I can tell you that the N3 is going to be safe. Where is it? Moy River. Bang. They deployed guys to Moy River. I'm not saying they uh, they replaced the army and, and, and that they hold any um, <laughs> military uh, accountability. 
But the minute we identified that the N3 corridor was what was between us and starvation, the taxi industry made sure that it was safe. And in fact, they were willing to deploy their own members to travel in convoys with uh, food trucks if that was required. So just from a, sec let alone the security side, the provision of food into the area was guaranteed by the taxi industry. And I'm, again, please don't, I don't want to take anything away from the SAPS nor the military. But uh, had there not been any military and had there not been any SAPS, uh, we could have guaranteed the free passage of uh, our logistics trucks into the province uh, with 100% confidence because the taxi industry behind it. Then on the, on the, on the violence side and, and the, the localized um, rioting, the taxi industry, you know, without them, like, you, like you've just ex explained now how, how they came in with their live ammunition, I wouldn't want to comment on that. Um, because I wouldn't want to incriminate them, but I can quite believe it. And I think that's the kind of uh, tough love that needed to be shown as, as sad as it is. And thank goodness that they were able to support us on that because they are a very powerful resource in, in keeping the peace. Uh, and they have access to a large membership base that, that, like I said, are not Sunday school teachers. Well, they might be, but not, not during the day. <laughs>